my friends, and welcome to Postscript. Nice to have you with us today. It's a sunny day in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia, where we're coming to you, and we're here with an interview with our friend Frank Jacob. And uh, Frank uh, is uh, coming to be with us at the uh, tr uh, Transition Talks on the 16th of November, and he, he joins us here from uh, from what, Bavaria, somewhere in uh, Germany. Hi, Frank. How are you? It's good to be here, John. Thanks for having me. Yes, Bavaria, Bavaria, Germany. Yep. Yeah, we're really looking forward to having you back. We really had a good time last year when you were here and with, with us in Berkeley Springs. And uh, both the folks that were here in person and all those that joined us by live stream uh, very much enjoyed your presentation. You're uh, got a background in uh, media and in uh, and in filmmaking and uh, and thinking about really interesting things about where the future is coming and so on and so thought I'd start this out by asking you what do you think where where are we going man I mean we're sitting here with uh, things all going sideways in new ways every day and where do you think this is going? What's your guess about the rest of the year or maybe into next year? Well, you know, there's various scales uh, of time that we're talking about here. So obviously um, what I'm looking forward to is in the next, you know, four to six weeks, I'm going to be there. Actually, in four weeks, I'm going to be there with you in person right at the time when, you know, America is going through this huge event this election you know and this one in particular as we all know has a lot of charge on it so i think that's um that's one level of chaos or activity that's going on chaos i mean in the sense that you know everyone is i think still very um they've been a little bit burned by this whole fiasco that happened last time around that led to all kinds of more chaos. And I think everyone's kind of anticipating potentially this kind of chaos this time around. You know, there's all these hypotheses like, oh, if Trump wins, will this happen? And if Harris wins, will this happen? My experience has always been that it's, it was a saying in Germany, uh, I don't know if it translates, but it said things are always cooked hotter than they're eaten. So, uh, you know, I think that people will be charged, you know, but it'll go over. I think it'll be fine. That's my sense. I don't have any uh, any um, uh, fears of getting on a plane and coming over there at all. Yeah. Uh, wow. But if we look at the the longer scales, you know, I've been I've been um, I just finished a, a new webinar and I called it time capsule for the future past. Right. Because. It's got information in it about ancient past, about history, long time, going back like 6,000 years. I'm trying to get to the root of where did kind of the trajectory that we've landed on had have its beginnings. And, you know, you can actually trace it back to those times. So we're talking about a large time scale. And what I'm talking about here is, is a certain, well, some people call it the age of Pisces, right? The fish age and stuff, right? Well, that, it seems to me that if you look at mythology, Every one of these large epoch areas of humanity, they come with certain lessons for humanity. And it seems very clear that the lesson that humanity went through this last time around in this Pisces era has to do with patriarchy, uh, authoritarian systems and control over nature. And, you know, we tried it, you know, and it's, it's pointless to blame and say, well, this person did that and this group did that. But all these religions, and I think in particular the Abrahamic religions, which push themselves to becoming the dominant force on the planet, have a lot to do with that. Uh, but rather than blaming it, it's better, I think, to take the perspective of, well, that was that experiment. And I think it's clear that experiment has failed. <laughs> so everyone's talking about the next age. You know, I remember all those songs, the age of Aquarius, right? Everyone's talking about the age of Aquarius. And that's another age, another big time spirit period that's just around the corner but just around the corner also in, in, the, in these scales means about 800 years. So we're obviously not going to see it in the flesh. But there are, you know, um, indications that the currents that are going to be the dominant aspect of the lessons that humanity will be going through in that age are already accessible to us now. And those have to do with wilderness, with nature, with the forces of nature, and in particular with the getting in balance really uh, between humanity and those forces, again, you know, to try to get back on track. 
because I think humanity's ultimate role is to be living in harmony and connection with all those forces, not working against them, not trying to dominate them, not trying to, to subdue them, but but harnessing them and working in and achieving this symbiosis that I think is part of our inherent genome. That's where I would say we're heading. And so to get to the long term, and this is going to what I'm going to be talking about, is you know um, it's chaos to calm, right? Well, how do we get to those? places now from here and i believe and you put me a challenge when you kind of titled that talk i didn't even really think about it until you put it there i'm like okay well i should what am i going to do for this and it's clear to me that what we're talking about now is we're just going to assume that we're going to land there everything's going to go fine but someone has to start to first of all identify the problems that we encountered that weren't working so well for us clearly labeling them, identifying them, names, places, events, directions that we went into. And the next step, of course, is then not to get stuck there because that tends to get sort of shrouded in negativity, but to actually pose some solutions. Like what kind of a, what kind of systems correspond to that new time? Like what kind of, you know, what kind of things are we looking at here in terms of structures around us in society that weren't working before? So I want to introduce or propose, let's say, a few of those different structures. Well, that'll that'll be very interesting. I want to go back when you early in in what you just said. You said that we failed at this last kind of uh, epoch, if you will, and um, I would challenge you, I guess, on that a bit and say, well, we got us to where we are now. We made certain. I mean, we certainly didn't rise to the occasion at the, in the highest way, but there's a whole lot that has been accomplished uh, that has gotten us to the place where this amazing place to where we're ready, if you will. Not everybody perhaps, but maybe never everybody was never gonna be in the in the game. I, I mean, it, you know, we certainly made some progress. Well, you know, that's why, I mean, I, I said lessons, right? And I think it's lessons and lessons mean we learn, right? We learn. In fact, that's what we're designed to do. We're designed to make errors or make lessons, have these lessons and uh, correct our, our ways and fix them. And you're absolutely right. And I guess I, I will I will, uh, I will concede that point. <laughs> it's true. Um, we did, you know, it wasn't a total waste. You know, it was like we, we, we've, um, there's this saying that the system isn't broken, it's functioning perfectly the way it was designed to. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, if we can draw the lessons from that system as it's functioning, because I think it's safe to say we don't necessarily want to stay in the same place peddling and treading no. water. Right? Well, not not at all. And so, so what's the bigger picture, do you think? Do you think that, uh, that let's, for instance, uh, one of the things I've been thinking about lately is the the what seems to be the very sophisticated, well-funded kind of efforts to essentially tamp down this evolutionary push for humanity. I mean, that, that, that there are a lot of things that seem to be just designed to make sure we don't kind of break through. Do you, do you think that's the truth, the case? Well, do you want to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole here? <laughs> yeah, sure. We got time. You know, I, in in the course of the research that I've been doing, I've run across, uh, you know, the material that was put together based on the Nag Hammadi, which is a series of bound books found in 1945 in uh, Egypt, Upper Egypt, and those books be are based on the work of a group called the Gnostics, uh, and they um, have a lot of interesting information in those materials that uh, that point toward. A force that was there at the origins of humanity. In fact, they have a whole creation narrative which differs from the one that's in the biblical account. And, you know, there's people that have taken that Gnostic material and, you know, they've approached it from the filter of a Christian perspective and used it to kind of like build their Lego blocks into a robot or into whatever. But you can take those same Lego blocks and you can you can actually find a neutral, unbiased version of what the Gnostics really were. And you find out that they actually put together a very detailed account of the forces that were behind the creation. And one of those forces was kind of um, a miscarriage of sorts of humanity. And that manifested in the form of something called archons. 
And there's uh, an amazing myth, uh, uh, comparative mythologist out there, highly underrated. His name is John Lash, and he's put a book out called Not in His Image. I highly recommend it. But I got in touch with him because I found him in the course of my research. And he's actually the guy that kind of brought that word back into the dialogue, into the into the, into the Internet. Archon. And archons are these beings that are, because they're not uh, fulfilled as humanity, they were created kind of as, a, as an accident of creation. And there's a whole accompanying creation story we won't have time for today, but I can maybe tie that into my talk a little bit. But essentially, because they came in as an aberration, there was an envy when they realized what the true purpose of this planet was and what the Anthropos was. And so they began to work against us. And they can't actually live within our biosphere. They're uh, not uh, organic um, biological beings. They're, you know, they're out. They live outside of our bubble, but they can affect us by making brief entries. Some people call them ETs. They were even described. Can you believe it or not? In this text that's like two thousand years old, that the description suits exactly what people are describing when little greys are abducting them in groups of three. And they even had a whole instruction manual for Gnostics who were encountering them way back then already. So they've been around a long time and they've influenced us and they've tried to penetrate in, but they have limited access physically. So the way they do it is they do it mentally. And in fact, there is a very interesting story about how they locked into our neural network. And because they did that, they essentially chose a vector race that and that vector race carried this through the world for thousands of years to the point where this this ideology which you could summarize as being kind of like um the ideology of uh master race or slave master slave relationship and this isn't actually what we were designed to do and this you know this master slave race ideology is re as reflected in pretty much everything you've seen happening you can look at it historically and in fact in my webinar i do talk about it historically right into uh, concrete examples of the Second World War and you know in bef and before that into this mentality that is there that that there is some uh, element of the human race which believes it's superior to others. And that I think you know I think you've I've seen you talk with Greg Braden about this the, you know these these religions that are kind of like the stumbling block because they seem to idolize this idea. We have to get past these belief systems. And it's interesting because Gnostics, the word itself means to know. And they were about knowing rather than believing. And they were there at the time at the formation of Christianity. And they came forward to say, nope, this isn't the way to do it. But they were, um, yeah, they were removed from the dialogue. Their books and their, I mean, all of the stuff they'd accumulated, they were the ones that were the mystery school founders that set up all these amazing mystery schools that were going on at that time, the Hellenic Age, and all these books that form, formed what's called the Library of Alexandria. They were largely responsible for putting that together. And as we know that that library is lost some way or other, it will, either it was burned or the Vatican took it and stashed it in the basement and won't let us have the key. So, you know, we're looking at information which was basically lost on a sliver, a fragment of that information resurfaced in the Nag Hammadi. And uh, that's what, I, you know, we have to sort of look at that and take it seriously. And that'll actually show us where some of these um, mistakes, and that's what they called them, because they didn't believe in an evil element in the universe. They only believed in error. And errors that go uncorrected begin to fester and turn into these systems that we see around us. Well, that's uh, interesting. It, it kind of parallels a little bit. I don't know if you're familiar with Barbara Marciniak and some of her uh, books uh, from the uh, late part of the 90s and so on. Uh, uh, communicating, apparently, uh, her conversations or her uh, engagement with the, what she calls and they call the Pleiadians. And uh, they have a... a, a a genesis story, if you will, that is uh, very much uh, along that same kind of line. I mean, it's, it's got its own kind of colors and its own kind of ideas, but uh, they, in fact, say that uh, this early uh, kind of dominant race uh, looked at humans and said, uh, you guys are going to get out of hand because you've got 12 strands of DNA and you're going to eat our lunch someday and if we don't do something about this and so that they really did uh genetic modification and kind of broke up and fragmented 10 strands of dna and that the 
process we're going through right now is the reconstitution of that uh, that DNA uh, into 12 strands. And that is kind of the essence about this emergent new human. Well, you can find, the thing is you can find, um, and because, uh, you know, as if you look at it comparatively in other mythologies, you can find elements of this same story uh, in other cultures, of course. And that, and that, it almost becomes kind of like a meme in a certain way. Uh, this story of intervention or interference from some extraterrestrial force. And I think that is real. I think there is something to it. What I like about the Gnostic material is that it's the earliest known. It's it's called, like in Germany, the word is Quelle, you know, it's source material. It's the earliest known source material we have. So it's to be taken very seriously. Um, and this is why I'm looking at it so intensely, because I went through a lot of years where I, I studied works that were channeled, uh, um, other you know belief systems that I got into, but I found I feel with this material it's really worth looking at because it's kind of like this goes back to the earliest you know accounts of this stuff by human beings and the way they describe it. Now, one thing that's interesting what you just said about you know the changing of the genetic strand and stuff like that. One thing that is very powerful, even more powerful you could say than the DNA, is something called epigenetics. And epigenetics means, you know, the it's like it's the the way it's what sits on wow. top of the code. It's the way the code is carried out. So there's a famous, I mean, I think you uh, know Bruce Lipton, um, and you know, I mean, he's he did an, he did a very infamous, oh, he had an infamous experience, let's say, in a lab where he cultured the same identical clone cells in different cultures. Right. And different. Um, and, and one was, you know, we have in our body a culture that's blood. But outside of the body, you can create these nutritional cultures with simulate blood. And he created three different cultures. And what happened is that in one dish, he got like muscle tissue and another dish. He got, uh, you know, neural networks and another tissue. You know, it's like what happens. You find out that it's not the gene that decides how the organism will emerge it's the environment it's in mm -hmm. right this is so powerful man this is like yeah. so if we look at the the culture role medium we can you know we can expand it outward to being the external influences on us sensory experiences when we feel like chaos and panic well we're not going to the, the way we express our genetics is going to be different than if we're living in a totally different environment in the world well, you're making the nature and nurture a kind of, you're embellishing the on the basic idea of nature and nurture and uh that's a very powerful idea i, I didn't realize that bruce had uh, done that kind of work well so what's there for the function of this period of time that is so full of stress and irrationality and everything else what do you think that's like doing well, I think it's forcing us to to look at it because I was looking at myself. I can only speak for myself, you know, and I was I've been at this stuff like, you know, cosmonaut, you might say, for quite some years, decades, really. And I've I've gone through a lot of um, belief structures and systems that I've looked at and analyzed and tried on to see how it fits. And in the end, you kind of realize after you go through them all. Um, like, where does it bring you? Right. And I think a lot of people, and in my case, I'm in a situation where I'm looking at the world, I'm going like, well, you know, even with all that, all those years and all, you know, embracing all these thoughts, you would think we would be much further along and, and towards changing it than we are. And so there are small groups. And, you know, I'd say we kind of belong to a, you know, a smaller group of people that are beginning to you know, just uh, tune in, you know, wake up or whatever you want to call it. Just, you know, there, that sense that it's time to uh, to get the information out there, to build systems that are going to carry the system forward in a more in a more um, harmonious way. But that's not the majority. The majority of people, if you go out on the sidewalk and you you just get your ear to the ground, you just realize that the average mentality of people out there, as much as we all wish and we think everyone's getting enlightened, it just isn't there yet, right? So th this is where the chaos, I think, for the most part is coming because those people are beginning to sense something is up, but they don't know what it is. And so they're just reacting. The one yeah. advantage that we have when we study this kind of stuff and we talk about it and we put it out there is that we can put it on the table and analyze it just like an experiment, just like Bruce Lipton's experiment. We can say, okay, well, look what's going on, you know, and look what's coming at us, right? This is the stuff that we can identify. And when we know and we can see the monster out there, we're not as scared of it any longer, 
we can actually we can see it we can work with it and we can embrace it as what it is instead of being shocked by it or just being reactive to it so i think that the time ahead for the people who are awake or aware is going to be one of um dealing with this issue of like on the one hand staying calm because when you're tying in and tuning into those future frequencies and flows you're actually anchoring this calm energy now but of course you have friends and family and not everybody's in the same state so they're going to be tugging on you so the biggest challenge i think for people that are waking up is to deal with the ebb and flow and tug and pull of the circumstances around them and still remain in a very focused and balanced place yeah interesting but do you think these archon uh, entities have are kind of in an, an extremis or an existential situation to where they um, see this big transition as something that is likely to take away the kind of the energies that this that sustain them and therefore in the short term uh, certainly uh, that there are going to be increasing attempts to try to to maintain the status quo in some way or another? Well, they are there as in a way as our teachers. They're provoking us to stand up and take back our power. And, you know, once we know that, it's, you know, it's less of a, a problem. They're going to, are they going to expand or increase or, or be thrashing to try and maintain control? It's definitely possible. I don't think, uh, you know, we've we've had an open enough dialogue and interaction to to kind of, really determine that but i would say that the signs of their presence is everywhere and they are a parasitic being i mean let's face it there's another word for them in the uh native american perspective i think it's called wetiko you know they're talking about these entities that which actually get into your mind and they're so deeply anchored into our minds that they begin to make decisions for you so if you're not aware of them there you there's experiments they did you know with uh, toxoplasma gandhi where you know mice were jumping into the mouths of of the cats literally you know that were infected so you know we are we have to accept that there's this parasitical infection and that's what they represent but it doesn't mean it's the end of us it certainly means that it's the end of them in a way or the end of their penetration into our bubble once we realize that. So are they going to put up a fight? I would absolutely be certain that they will put up a fight. Um, but, you know, I think it's ultimately in our destiny and it's in our blueprint. And if you if you embrace the Gnostic creation narrative about a plasma being at the center of our galaxy, these aeons as yeah. being the God creation forces, and the idea that Sophia was so uh, in love and, and, and attracted to the human experiment, which had previously failed, according to the, the legend, uh, she left the safety of the Pleroma and actually sort of flew into the arms of the Orion uh, Nebula and collided, you know, with all, all the matter and became tangled up in this whole drama. And ultimately what happened is she actually turned into this planet. So she is like Gaia, yeah, Sophia. She right. is the planet. And out of this planet is, you know, we emerge. We're, she's our habitat. And we have this symbiotic relationship with this higher plasmic being. And plasma science is backing up a lot of these stories now and more and more. There's this guy called Sidovich, this Russian uh, researcher who proved that plasma has consciousness. And so you can, it isn't much to extrapolate if you have a little bit of AI like consciousness in a tiny lab experiment that if you blow that up to the size of a galaxy, you're talking about consciousness here on an unfathomable level, right? And it's interesting because if you look at the these paradigms, you can see a direct a correlation fractally between the neural network of a human brain and the neural networks of plasmic lines running through the entire cosmos. So there yeah. is a plan here. There is a an idea. And the idea was that we would have to um manifest this freedom this free will and this absolute creativity and we would pull it that's that's the plan for us to pull it off so i think it's inevitable that it will be pulled off the question is are we going to be the ones that are going to pull it off or are we heading into the sixth major extinction level event on the planet and uh, we have to decide are you going to be the compost or are you going to be the gardener <laughs> <laughs> nice nicely put frank what's up What's the best book uh, that you would suggest to, to try to understand uh, the whole Gnostic Gospels uh, uh, 
Well, I would say uh, just John Lash's book is a good starting. In fact, uh, probably the best starting place, because what I like about his work is he's not, you know, he hasn't conformed it to some belief system or ideology. He tried to look at what the Gnostics in their own purest sense were like. And that that's a good place to start before you go and anywhere what's, else. What's the name, what's the name of it? Not, not in his image. Not in his image. Definitely right. check it out. And the other thing you can check out is time capsule for the future past, of course, because I, I tied that information into some very, very uh, amazing historical uh, material that coincided with. So we just kind of hit it off and had a great uh, collaboration on it. So that's another place to kind of look at things. Oh, that's great. It's going to really be fun to have you back. And uh, we'll continue this conversation kind of writ large uh, and uh, wander all over the world in the, af in the afternoon that you'll be with us on the 16th of November. And so uh, we're looking forward to that. And for our viewers, uh, uh, let me remind you that uh, that's Transition Talks. And that's what we do every month here at the Arlington Institute. And we come to you live from Berkeley Springs, our little resort town in West Virginia, about 100 miles from Washington and Baltimore. And uh, we brought, we not only hold forth with a, a, a delightful kind of local community, but we also live stream this all over the world. And so no matter where you are, you can participate. You can find out about it at arlingtoninstitute.org. And we hope you'll take a look. And Frank, we're looking forward to having you 16th of November, Saturday afternoon, one o'clock till five o'clock. And it's always fun. We get together and have dinner with, you know, 30, 40 people afterwards. And it's a delightful kind of community and uh, engagement kind of process for trying to get ready for this and participate effectively in this amazing kind of change that's going on. So thank you, my friend. Uh, nice well, it'll be an honor to be there and join you. I look forward to it again, just like last year, and uh, have a good time before I get there. Great. Thanks.